Welcome to Astronomy Cast, episode 424, Lightning. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cause. You know what I said? Should have said Astronomy Cast. I said, welcome to you. I'm going to do this again. Here we go. Not my day for starts. Astronomy Cast, episode 424, Lightning. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. Uh, hilariously, uh, last week we talked about uh, cyclonic storms, and this week, where I live on the west coast of Canada, we are about to be smashed by a cyclonic storm, the leftover super typhoon that is crossing the Pacific. So uh, if you don't hear me next week... Uh, it's because we just got wiped off the west coast of Canada. We will send paddle boats. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, yeah. We we will definitely have a fl have flooding uh, from our river uh, as we do every year. We, this happens I, all the time. But yeah. and you're in your basement right now. Oh yeah, I've never had flooding in my house. Okay. But we've had flooding, uh, you know, from the r nearby river that sort of fills up the local park, and you can then take your kayak and go or canoe and and enjoy uh, an aquatic version of the local soccer fields. It's pretty funny. <laughs> so, um, yeah, hopefully, it's not it's not that bad. We'll see. But I'll, I'll let you know how it goes next week after we. Uh, so now I get to. I guess the point is I get to experience a cyclonic storm firsthand. So does this mean that that if things follow through, uh, this week you're going to have massive lightning storms? Nope. We never okay. get lightning here. But You're uh, right. You don't. And let's find out. So it turns out that nature figured out how to use electricity long before the humans did. Lightning storms are common across the Earth and even the solar system. What causes this electricity in the sky and how can science use it to understand the world around us. All right, Pamela. Uh, yeah, so you were just you were just talking about this in the intro, which is that you know we're about to get lightning here, but we're not. We never do. And in fact, this is one of the things that my wife is so surprised is is that she comes from Texas, where uh, lightning storms are just a regular basis, and they have these huge lightning storms that roll in sometimes every couple of days. Uh, we maybe hear lightning here on the west coast of Canada once a year, maybe twice a year, almost never. Yeah, there there is a, a fabulous graphic that we will try and put up in the show notes that I know you have in Universe Today. It's on Wikipedia. Um, it's kind of all over the internet because it's a map of the density of lightning strikes all across the planet. And you look at it and it's just like the universe hates North and South America, Africa, and the Asia Pacific area, but like Europe and the non Asia Pacific parts of Asia, they're good, no lightning strikes. And it, it all has to do with where we have a atmosphere that experiences a lot of friction. Now, I, I have to admit this, this is one of the shows that I kind of picked because I live in Tornado Alley. And and so, so something was going on in in out your window, and you're like, hmm, maybe that's, that's exactly. a show topic, right? So so Susie had had pestered me, hey, we need a topic for Friday, and I literally looked out the window, and there is this wall of dark evil of with punctuations of lightning roiling across the sky towards us. And I'm like, we can do lightning this week, and um. I have to admit, though, the first thing I learned in prepping for this show that at the age of 42, I've been misspelling the word lightning my entire life. What? Did I misspell it? I, I don't know if you did. So lightning. Right. So a lot of people pronounce it lightning. Lightning, which is where and, light levels go up, where you brighten up a, a scene in your camera. And, and it's also a medical term that I'm not going to go into that involves things with pregnancy. So if you spell it that way, spell check will never, ever uh, let you know. So right. You know. And so you're constantly spelling it lightening, but it's really light -ning. Ning. So there's no E involved. So let this be a lesson for everyone out there. Lightning and thunder 
there there is one e in that combination and it's in thunder not in lightning thunder <laughs> okay so you mentioned that it's like regions that are of higher friction so so what's going on what is causing the lightning so I, no matter what world you go to and this is the cool thing is physics here is the same as physics everywhere um, when you get a turbulent atmosphere, this is an, an atmosphere where you have, uh, you either have convective cells rising or you have some sort of a wind pattern where things are getting jostled. You end up with different different molecules uh, forming the atmosphere. So, for instance, if you have a cold front, you may have ice up in the atmosphere. You may be fine down at ground level. But think of all those nights when you've looked up and there's been a halo around the moon. That's because there's ice crystals in the atmosphere that are refracting that light. Now, if those ice crystals that have formed in the atmosphere start rubbing up against each other due to, well, turbulent convective cells, high speed wind, all of those things that happen when you have a cold front mixing with warm air or a warm front mixing with cold air, all of this mixing of air of different temperatures that has moisture involved ends up with ice particles or you can even end up with slush in the atmosphere. These particles rubbing up against each other, it's the same as a balloon against a wall that you're rubbing up and down and you end up with charge on the two different surfaces that's different charge. This is triboelectricism, which is like my favorite word, triboelectric. Um, when this happens, you end up with an exchange of charge and you can end up with a whole bunch of charge of one type on the bottom of a cloud and of another type on the top of a cloud. And as this potential gets bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, eventually the charge has to go somewhere. And so the, I guess the molecules that are bouncing into each other are, are just the, the atmospheric, just whatever's in the air, right? So oxygen, it's, it's usually nitrogen. you have dust particles, seed moisture around them, and form ice or slush. Right. Um, interestingly, ice tends to like get positive charge all over it. But if you instead end up with like moist, slushy gook in the atmosphere, think snow. Okay. Um, and so, so you've got this sort of difference of charge that's kind of happening in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. How does that then turn into the lightning that we experience? It, it's very simply, the air is trying to be an insulator, trying to keep the negative charge that is usually at the bottom of the cloud away from the um, positive charge at the top of the cloud, or even better, you end up with induced charge on the ground. So the air is trying to prevent the charge from jumping from the cloud to the ground or from the cloud somewhere else in the cloud. But eventually the charge potential will get so great that it overcomes the atmosphere's ability to act as an insulator. And, and the first thing that happens, and you may have seen this, I know I've had the misfortune of seeing it a little bit too close. You'll sometimes notice things, pointy objects like lightning rods start to get a glow around no. them. No. No, we've never seen this. <laughs> you need to travel more. No. It's awesome and terrifying and awesome. I, I could miss that. That'd be all right. <laughs> no, actually, I was, uh, I was doing uh, a show in New Mexico about uh, back in June. And, and we were going to be doing like a, like a live – it was at the Bandelier uh, National Monument, uh, and we were going to be doing some, like, setting up some telescopes, and we were going to do some live viewing, and I was going to give a talk, and a lightning storm moved in, and there was lightning strikes all around us, and the uh, and the park rangers had this gadget that told them when a lightning strike had just happened and how far away it was, and it was sort of freaking out, and so they were like, okay, we all have to go inside now. We can't really be out here and 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 be standing out you know definitely Fraser you can't be out on a you know out on a stage while there's lightning going off all around us so uh so I but I didn't stick around to look for things starting to glow had I I think I would have panicked so so I tend to get obsessed with getting my camera set up 
and fail to notice the world around me sometimes. Yeah. And uh, back when I was a graduate student, I was observing at McDonald Observatory. And uh, I had with me a fabulous undergraduate um, who had what may have been the worst observing run for a first observing run ever. Um, one of the things that happened was we were out on the catwalk of the 107 inch at McDonald. I was setting up my camera to take pictures of distant thunderstorms that were taking place above forest fires off in the distance, which the undergrad was the first person to spot. And while I was setting up my camera, she's just like, is that the lightning rod over there? And she had this fabulous Arkansas accent and the lightning rod was buzzing slightly. And all the hair on our arms was up, but I was so focused on getting this photo that I, I had failed to notice any of this. Can't talk, and I'm doing science. <laughs> so we go inside and there's double doors out to, to the, the catwalk and we had the double doors open. So I just set up my, my camera straight inside the double doors. And as soon as I was done setting up my camera, the, the 82 inch telescope, just a hum, couple hundred feet away from us, got totally nailed with lightning. And um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, so before I, you freaked me out, uh, we were talking about how you've got this sort of difference in charge in the cloud layer that that then, you know, as, as just regular electricity, the, you know, if you've got too many, you know, too much of a charge in one location, that charge wants to balance out and jumps, to, wants to jump to the other location. That can be from cloud to cloud, or that can be from cloud to ground, and, and in general, the bulk of the, the lightning in central locations is cloud to cloud, and the bulk of the lightning in more northern locations is uh, cloud to ground, and this is because of the temperature differentials. Um, so, so you have lots of different things at play. You have how low is the, the bottom of the cloud compared to the ground. You have what is the temperature different differential between the cloud layer and the ground. You have how high is the cloud. In some cases, the, the clouds will be only a couple of kilometers up at their lowest level, but then they'll be a score of kilometers in, in height from bottom of cloud to top of the cloud. And all of these things factor in to figure out, is it going to be more cloud to ground or more cloud to cloud? So, so one of the, my favorite things that I ran across is if you are someone in like Norway, which has all of these convective cells and temperature differentials and is at a very high latitude, um, you're going to get 50% of the lightning is, is cloud to ground. Now, the other thing is there's certain hot spots on the planet that average hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lightning strikes per year. Congo is one of those places. It has all of the right thermal conditions and very active volcanoes. All of these things pile up at once. And for the most part, we're able to count the cloud to ground lightning strikes. But because they have less of a temperature, temperature differential there at the equator, um, they're only getting like 10% cloud to ground strikes. So there is just phenomenal, phenomenal amounts of lightning in these hot spots like Com Congo. There's some places in Brazil, north of Florida. There's just hot spots on the planet where lightning happens. Uh yeah, and places like where I live where they don't happen all the time. Even though we get rainstorms, we just don't get thunderstorms in the same way. But, and it's because you're not getting the active convective cells. So what's happening is you have warm ground air filled with moisture rising up, cooling. Cool air then sinks. And, and so this sets up a turbulent atmosphere and all of this action it's it's this action that causes the lightning to occur you guys just get every day huh the atmosphere is saturated with water we're gonna let it fall out of the sky now right it's uh, a little yeah. bit gentler yeah totally uh now one of the most kind of amazing phenomenons is when you've got like some kind of volcanic eruption that's where you see some of the most just mind-bending lightning 
ever. Uh, have you seen some of those pictures of like uh, Ecuadorian volcanoes with crazy plumes of smoke and there's and there's like lava coming out of the volcano and then there's just lightning all through so wh why is that happening so it's this is called pyrocumulus clouds i love this word i'm sorry i'm far too excited about yeah, this topic clearly lightning is just fabulous um so so with pyrocumulus clouds you end up uh, either with forest fires or volcanic activity, you end up with all of these particles in the atmosphere that when you rub them together, you end up with electricity building up, charge building up. So you have ash, you have pumice, you have soot, all of this different particulate matter getting turbulently mixed in a hot, moist environment causes charge to build up and it can also sometimes facilitate the discharges happening more rapidly because the potential is a little bit different. So if you have just like your normal everyday big old angry thundercloud, it's water vapor and air that is forming that buffer between the bottom and the top of the cloud or between the bottom of the cloud and the ground that the electricity has to get over. You end up with these charged channels forming where this is Reeve of the St. Elmo's fire that I was talking about that's saying, hey, we have a channel where things are starting to get ready to form. And you have a channel coming down from the bottom of the clouds. When these channels meet, you end up with massive discharge. This is the lightning. Yeah, when you see those like, like uh, time lapse or like, you know, slow motion uh, videos of the lightning strikes, you actually can see that. You can see the the current reaching up from the ground at the same time that the current is reaching its way down from the sky. When those two finally find a pathway, that's when the lightning strike happens. It's an amazing and, thing to see. So these are called your upward and downward streamers and and they have different charge because you have the positive being induced on the ground, the negative on the bottom of the cloud. Now, you end up with a completely different um, potential barrier to overcome. And you have all of these particles that can help channel the lightning through the volcanic or smoke-induced clouds. And this just increases all it it's the kind of thing that we don't fully understand because there's too much going on which is i think why i as a scientist get so excited about it because we don't fully understand it uh, also it's kind of scary and dangerous uh and explodey explodey uh so now the earth is not the only place that experiences lightning no. So, so one of the things that we've talked about the last few episodes is how we end up with weather on multiple worlds. Now, with both Saturn and Jupiter, you end up with convective cells in the atmosphere. You end up with temperature regions mixing. You end up with storms. And you end up with massive amounts of lightning on Jupiter and lesser amounts, but we still see storms occurring on Saturn. And, and it's just, again, it's these temperature variations leading to convection cells. You have water vapor in the atmosphere. Things rub together, get charged, discharge lightning. So what places in the solar system, if you were to fly your Carl Sagan spaceship quickly across the solar system, where could we find examples of, of lightning? anywhere where we have convection and water moisture. So the thing is, it's been theorized to occur just about everywhere. It's hard to just happen to be catching it on a spacecraft just what right. The first time we saw lightning on Saturn was in 2009. So there could be lightning pretty much everywhere that has an atmosphere. So like Mercury, not so much. But Venus for sure. Mars. We've seen it on Saturn and Jupiter. We haven't seen it on Mars so far that I know of, but there's no reason that we wouldn't see it on Uranus and Neptune as well with the storms they have and the water vapor that exists in their atmosphere. Titan. Titan, maybe. I don't think the convective cells are violent enough. Right. Uh, no, there's actually this great, if you go to like uh, NASA's SoundCloud account, they've got links to all of their, you know, various audio recordings that they've got. And one is, I think, lightning in 
in Jupiter. Now, they're obviously, they're not Saturn, actually... Saturn, they have one too. They have one for Saturn too, yeah. And it's yeah. not like they're actually, you know, they're not recording these things with a microphone, of course, because the space wouldn't translate the sound. But they are um, sort of taking, a, um, you know, they're, they're like recording the the... I guess the polarity of the atmosphere at a certain point, and then they're able to detect when these when these lightning strikes are going off, and they're able to play these these sounds, which are pretty cool. And we can see this in other forms of light than optical. I mean, here here on Earth, where we're used to the the flashes that occur if you're in the right part of the planet. Um, and we see it with our eyeballs. A lot of us grew up learning to count the seconds between seeing the flash and hearing the thunder so you could tell how far away the storm was. But if you have a radio, you can hear the burst of static associated with the, the sudden ionization as, as plasma is formed in the atmosphere. If you have an X-ray detector, you may be able to detect the X-rays that are given off in the process. This this is violent and and shows up all across the electromagnetic spectrum in different ways. So I've got I've got a sound clip here that uh, this is going to be a first. I'm going to try and oh no, you know what? There's no way that I can play this through the actual podcast, so I won't actually be able to. Unless we'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, unless Chad is going to be able to do it. Maybe he'll hear this and and when he's doing the edit, he'll uh, he'll put this in. So I'm going to put this in through the live stream and then and then I'm not sure what we're going to do for the show. Maybe we'll just edit out that I even said it. So here we go. Listen to this. All right. So hopefully the. There you go. So I think. Whoop. All right. Hopefully, people who are on the live stream were able to hear the the sound of the of the lightning on on Jupiter, which is pretty cool. Um, so now, what do we do if we're in a place where lightning is gonna be happening? So, so first of all, you want to be the shortest thing around, right? So I don't have to run faster than the bear, faster than my uh, than the bear. I just have to run faster than my friends. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so electricity is lazy. It, it wants the easiest path between two different charges. So if you have your negative cloud bottoms, if you have induced charge on the ground, it's going to find the shortest path to the ground, which means the tallest object. So either the tallest tree on a hill the only golfer on a golf course um it's it's gonna go whatever path makes it easiest to get that charge dispersed right i kind of imagine that there are these like when, like i said when you saw that little when you watch that time lapse or what that the, sorry that slow motion version of it uh, you can see those little tendrils. There's tendrils kind of coming up from everywhere. You, the trees, the and it's like whichever ones connect, that's where the bolt, that's where the bolt of lightning finds its way back down. So you just don't want to be on the pathway. And and if you're not sure entirely how to get away from the pathway, there's a few stupid things you shouldn't do. One thing that a lot of people have tried doing, which isn't so good, is like spreading yourself flat on the ground to try and make yourself as small as possible in height. Now, the problem is you have just increased the surface area of your body that is connected to the ground. And the problem is if the ground near you is struck, that electricity is going to flow through your body. And if it flows over your heart, it can disrupt your heartbeat, which could kill you, which is bad. So one of the things that I learned when I was a kid is kneel down, keep your two feet on the ground, and don't touch anything else, because hopefully that will prevent electricity from going through your heart. Um, so yeah, things like that are best avoided. Um, but so like if there's on. a tree, don't go near the tree. Don't go near the tree. Do not put especially your left hand on the tree while your feet are on the ground. Right. So Fairly we'll, certain death. Right. Uh, but then, but I mean, you don't want to be so far away from the tree that that you now form, you become the tallest thing in the, in the region, right? Right. So in general, you want to go away. Going into your car is actually a fairly fabulous place to go. Because again, 
electricity is lazy. If your car gets struck by lightning and it's not like 100% cloth and fiberglass, which some current cars are, if it's like a normal metal car, the electricity will go on the outside of your car and you're safe on the inside. This is what's called a Faraday cage effect. In fact, you could be inside of a giant bird cage and if the bird cage was actively getting struck by an angry Zeus, you could run your hand along the inside of the bird cage while the lightning hitting the bird cage would run down the outside of those exact same wires. Wow. And if you happen to ever visit the city of Boston, the Boston Museum of Science has an amazing indoor lightning storm demo that they do where they stick someone in the moral equivalent of a bird cage and don't kill them. Nice. That's, that's convenient that they don't kill them. Uh, that is bad. Right. But I mean, you know, if you're going to be in your house, make sure you've got a lightning rod in the house that connects to the ground. Grounding rods are a good thing. Um, so, so one problem that, that I've personally run into, Massachusetts does get totally hit with lightning. Um, and so while I was living in, in Somerville many years ago, the television antenna for our building was struck by lightning and the uh, electricity happily went down it and into the back of my television and then into the electrical system of the house and fried everything attached to that particular surge protector. Um, so, uh, yeah, you want to have something that is taller than your TV antenna, antenna and the ground goes to the ground, not to part of your house. So one thing, and I don't know if this is a myth, I actually don't know this if this is true. So I'm just, you know, they have in like various science fiction shows, you've got like some kind of spacecraft moving through a nebula or something like that. And there's like lightning going on. I think it was like Wrath of Khan, I think they had yeah, that. Yeah, I think as it was, was moving through Khan. the Matara Nebula. Now we've already discussed the fact that you know, if you were passing through a nebula, they wouldn't even see it. You wouldn't even know you're inside of it. But are there any situations that are not an atmosphere that you can get some kind of electricity or lightning going on? So the speed at which the lightning discharges and the frequency at which they're taking place in the Wrath of Khan always kind of bothered me. But Electric fields permeate space. They're generated by all sorts of different things. And if you end up with any potential differential for whatever the reasons are, shock waves from a star, stellar winds from something that is young and angry, you can get lightning bolts. It's just a matter of are they going to be that dozen of lightning bolts per hour that you get with a good old-fashioned roaring storm going across the surface of the earth or is it going to be more like slow build slow build slow build discharge wait a few thousand years right and i wonder what kinds of environments around like rapidly rotating things like neutron stars black holes things like that well, those are all compact bodies that don't really have clouds of material necessarily around them except for that accretion disk yes and, and so this is something where I am not the kind of astronomer you ask questions about magnetic fields and dust to. Yes. But now I'd love to corner someone like Brian Gainsler and say, Brian, tell me about where you can get lightning storms. Because, you know, all you need is that electric differential. Yeah, that's super interesting. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. My pleasure. That and recording. now we stop. Welcome to the boring part of the show. Save. 120, or 424? Yes. Okay. Export. Oh, Tuck Tang on YouTube wanted to know, could you get lightning in a fluid? Um, you can get electric discharge through a fluid. Uh, 
I don't know Electrical. if it would. I don't know if it would form like that clear yeah. forking bolting pattern that you get through the atmosphere. Dielectric fluids and their use in electrical welding. It's a thing. Yeah. It's a thing. Electric discharge machines. I mean, part of the problem, right, is that the the fluid doesn't act like a very good insulator, right? So it's really just what is the fluid? What is the what is the so is it an insulator or is it a conductor? And then, and water tends to be a pretty good conductor, right? Right, right. This this is why you shouldn't be swimming because, like, first of all, you will be the tallest thing in the water if you happen to surface. And second of all, if the water gets struck anywhere, you're getting struck. Yes, because it's going to conduct to you as well. Uh, okay, well, let's, uh, let's throw us your questions. Uh, sprites. Jamie Bradley wants us to talk about sprites. Oh, man. Um Basically, this this is an atmospheric phenomena that, like ball lightning, isn't really well understood. It's very rarely observed. Uh, was first observed by astronauts who were essentially told they were crazy people um, because it wasn't something we knew about. And it and it happens high up in the atmosphere. It's it's basically flickering of electric charge. Yeah. They're cool. cool. Yeah. Go read atmosphere. I love astronauts accounts of it those great time lapse that are taken from the space station where they're flying above all these thunderstorms you can see all of the lightning storms but from above and it's just this amazing uh view um noel ruppenthal has asked a question yeah you don't have to just ask us questions about today's episode by the way um so noel ruppenthal wants to know can two galaxies being carried away from each other by the expansion of the universe experience time dilation if their relative speed is a significant fraction of C, if so, which galaxy is slower? So does that question make sense? If two galaxies are moving yeah. away from each other, yes. can so they experience time, time dilation? Time dilation is the wrong word for it. So, so, okay, unpacking this. You have the twin experiment. You have twin A stays on the surface of the planet. Twin B is accelerated up to close to the speed of light, exerting energy in the process of getting work was done to accelerate the dude. Um, he or she then travels around space and near the speed of light comes back because they were the one who was accelerated, went close to the speed of light, came back decelerated. They will have experienced less passing time than person who stayed on the surface of the planet. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take, both of them and neither of them accelerates but they are carried apart by the expansion of the universe such that they're far enough apart that the amount of space between the two of them causes the rate at which they are being expanded apart to appear to be at um, near the speed of light what is being asked is in this case where they're being carried away by the expansion of the universe is their time dilation so first of all they're never going to get back together ever mm -hmm. to compare ages this one looking at this this one will always see this one in the past this one looking at this one will always see this one in the past right and and so uh option c something entirely different i uh, we did an episode about this, just sort of like about what time it is in the universe, that things are moving around and there are different times. And uh, uh, Brian Koberlein uh, sort of consulted on the science for that episode. And the gist was that that there is a difference. There is because of things moving around, but but moving within space, not moving because of space. Right. Yeah. There is some time dilation and I think But that's said, when things are moving within space. Yeah. And so he said space. there can be about a thirty thousand year difference. So so that's the case of they're moving apart to the due to the expansion of the universe. This one gets near a supercluster of galaxies yeah. and gets sucked into the supercluster of galaxies. It's that acceleration yeah. that is being done 
through space that causes the time dilation. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Lillian, Lillian Brennan is saying, I've heard that pure water does not conduct electricity, but it's the impurities in the water that conducts it. Oh, this is the whole deionized water thing. And yes, deionized water that is utterly pure um, doesn't not a conductor and i have to remember i don't i have to say i don't remember off the top of my head all of the physics of how that works um okay uh let's see ball lightning Is it's that awesome i've seen it before like with your own eyeballs yeah really? so when, when i was a, a high school kid growing up in new england there was a storm rolling in over the hills and um I, I remember I was lying in bed reading because teenager, nerd, that's what you do. And I looked out and it creeped the bejesus out of me because there was like, it looked like basically some evil superhero rolling across the sky. Just this, this electric ball just kind of went across the sky and then disintegrated and there was a boom and it was awesome. That's cool nothing like that here <laughs> so so like in your brain imagine what ghost rider would look like riding through the clouds and that was kind of like what my teenage brain saw wow um all right so that's the whole thing uh adventure prime fire says what about dunes on 67p being caused by electric transport I so, don't know anything about that. Right. But one of the things, I mean, one of the whole, we just covered this in the Weekly Space Hangout, okay, which so is you, that. The, I haven't read about right, it. Right. So the, you know, the, the mission that's landing on Mars in just five days from ESA and uh, Roscosmos is going to be trying to study this sort of how uh, there's like a magnetic effect on the dust on Mars and whether, the, you know, how that will sort of lift up the dust and kind of transport around. And we also get that on the moon, which is where uh, as you move from the day-night cycle on the moon, you actually get this the Terminator as it moves around the, the moon, it lifts up the dust electrically and then brings it back down. And that's one of the reasons why this dust kind of gets around on the on the surface of the moon and so uh i guess the question then is is this happening on 67p i wouldn't i mean and maybe even forming into dunes but i i haven't heard at all about this so stay tuned that's the kind of thing next week is the division of planetary sciences and the european planetary sciences conference it's a joint meeting it's being held in pasadena our own morgan is yep. going to be there and, and sandy uh, oh yeah yep. so I forgot Sandy was going. We're going to have a bunch of members of the CosmoQuest team there. So this is where we're going to find out about stuff like that. Yeah, and we're going to be reporting quite a bit on uh, on that. And, and we'll probably have a live, you know, have them live next week on the show. So it'll be good. Uh, any updates on Juno, Ed Thompson wants to know? Um, it's there. It's yeah. doing science. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it's not I, such a fancy all, showboating all this, mission, you know? All the stuff will come out next week during DPS. Right now, yeah. I'm sure people are sitting on things, waiting to be able to showcase them to a loud um, auditorium of their colleagues. Uh, Ryo Sans says, I'd never even heard of ball lightning in today, and then I just watched a video on YouTube. I'm sure YouTube is the place to see as much ball lightning as you want. That's really cool. And you, my friend, I think just experienced confirmation bias because that's what happens when you don't think you've ever heard of something before. And it's just that you never notice that you're hearing about it until you hear it twice in one day. Or, or hearing you talk about it went and searched it up on YouTube. Well, that's true. I yeah. don't know what order, yeah. order of events things yeah. occur. Um, uh, David Joseph Wesley wants to know what kind of atmospheric conditions cause thunder snow? Which, oh. al which also sounds like a Canadian metal band from 1987. No, thunder snow is something that we also got growing up. It happens with nor'easters, which are essentially winter hurricanes. This is where you will spontaneously get like 36 inches of snow in 24 hours, and the dog hates you. And it's um, and there's lightning and thunder going on. Yeah, and you sometimes get tornadoes in the middle of the storm, and um, so so this is 
basically where you have, again, turbulent atmosphere, moisture, cold front and warm front mixing, and all of this causes the frozen particles, whether they be snow or ice, to rub up against each other, create charge, and that gets discharged. And this is where you get thunder snow, and it is, again, quite awesome. You let Avron wants to know if Canadians play metal. Rush doesn't count. <laughs> we, have, we have some metal bands. Actually, I saw the greatest metal band, uh, which is a bunch of robots. Uh, I think it's called like Collider or something like that. Anyway, and they're just, it's the greatest thing ever. It's these, these uh, robots playing speed metal. And, and especially have, the drummer. I have to laugh because my Canadian husband plays old time blues. <laughs> yeah, he's not playing uh, speed metal. No. Um, any other questions going on? Did we really talk about thunder? We just talked about the lightning side. We didn't even talk no, about No, we totally noise. ignored that yeah. sound is a thing. <laughs> that sound happens. Yeah. Oops. Mm. We should talk about speed of sound next episode. Have we not talked about speed of sound in, in Astronomy I don't Cast? I think so. Uh, really? Maybe not. We've been doing this for 10 years. And you won't let us talk about future missions. But they launch all the time. So we can regularly really talk about new things. Yeah, we things. talked about sound. Episode 311. Um, <laughs> we should, though, maybe do another uh, episode. We should look up some spacecraft that have maybe happened since we... Like, I don't think we've done Curiosity. No, we haven't. So yeah. we can go back and do Curiosity. Kepler. Uh, I think we did Kepler as part of the mission. No, 190. Else... That's right. All right. Yeah. No, we haven't done Curiosity. We've done rovers in general. Mm -hmm. So I'll bet you if we take a good look, we can catch up our, our missions and maybe even talk to some people like uh, Dr. Curiosity. We'll do that, you know. And then the week after that, do uh, the Mission Curiosity. Uh, Tom Van Scudder wants to know if we're going to do another space movie night. Maybe. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Did you see that? No. You have no idea what we're talking about? So, no, no so idea. So Nicole and I watched Armageddon live on YouTube. Do you not like yourselves? No, we don't. Uh, and we got drunk and... Uh, and just chatted about the science, and uh, it was pretty fun. Yeah, it's pretty hilarious. We, we should do something like that, like Thanksgiving weekend or something in the U.S., because everyone's watching stupid movies. It's yeah. Kind of well, the, so the trick was we did it like um, Rift Tracks. So because Armageddon is on Netflix, we put the show up on Netflix, and then we watched it. And at the same time, we did like a behind, you know, we just did a commentary as it was going on. It was pretty fun. Yeah, I, I'm totally agreeing yeah. with this idea. I'm just thinking Thanksgiving is an excellent time to plan doing it. Um, sure. Uh, but Thanksgiving was last weekend. Yeah, that's why I said U.S. Thanksgiving. Oh, U.S. Thanksgiving. Right. Yeah, the weekend that goes on forever, unlike your one-day dignified ceremony. Um, yeah, we. Hey, have everyone, dinner's on. Day. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to doing whatever we were doing, playing video games, watching TV. Hi, Ava. Someone in the chat wanted me to say that, so I just did. Okay. Um, yeah, if you guys thought that was super fun, I, it was pretty tough because a lot of people showed up and were expecting to be able to watch Armageddon, and that was not going to happen, right? Like we weren't gonna we weren't gonna take a, a copyright takedown. No, uh, but you can periodically say what timestamp you're at. Well, we ran the timestamp on this, okay. on our stream. So it actually said it said countdown to Armageddon, which was actually a reference. I'll see if anybody in the chat knows what the reference was. Uh, and then once once the movie started, it said countdown from Armageddon, and it just counted up. And uh, it was pretty yeah. it was pretty awesome. Uh, it that was works. a lot of fun. It was fun to just sort of watch the 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 movie and uh, you know, yak about it. I mean, you and I had the, that idea a couple of years ago about doing like the old Carl Sagan Cosmos, where we would just watch that and just literally just like update uh, poor Carl Sagan on the science, you know, because he's because it's like right. back in the 70s or back in the early 80s. And he was like, you know, and this is these are quasars. And we don't really know what quasars are. We think they might be 
black holes, but they might be something else. And we could be like, no, 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 it's black holes, Carl. They're, you were right. So yeah. I think that might be uh, that might be fun to do. So anyway, I think uh, and and lots all, of options. Yeah, there's a bunch of options, and there's a lot of you know the Martian is on. Um, and Netflix. someone's suggesting Interstellar. Yeah, Interstellar. So that's fun. Um, so yeah, we have options. Dan H says, "Are you guys aware of Professor Brian Cox?" Yes. Yes, we are. How can you not be aware of him? Yeah, yeah. Have you met him? I don't think so. No, neither have I. Phil has. Phil's Phil's uh, Phil, but Phil's buddies with everybody, in, including us. So we knew uh, him before. Di- well, he was already kind of a superstar before we even knew him. Hmm. Uh, yeah, he's always he's always ten years ahead of us. Um, let's see. Yeah, people can uh, plan nine from outer space. Could do that. David Joseph Wesley su- su- suggesting Serenity, but there's yeah. not enough science in it. I love the movie though. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Okay. Time to wrap so, this up. Yeah. Yes. No, we're not going to do it during the presidential debate. We like each other. <laughs> oh. Someone should do a live. I wonder if people are doing that through a live stream of the presidential debate where they just put it on. TV and then they... so so they're they're tweeting it. Nate Silberman and his crew over at five thirty eight. Yeah. I I usually end up following them on five thirty eight while listening to it on NPR because nerd. Mm-hmm. There you go. Uh, okay, cool. Well, thanks everyone for watching this week. Thank you, Pamela, for uh, bringing the brain, and uh, we will see all of you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Stop recording.